Good morning. There we go. Good morning. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. Just getting a little bit set up here. Just about to go live and the screw fell out of my glasses. So now I've got glasses I can sort of see out of. I can see well enough to run the show. Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing this morning? Let me frame us up a little bit. There we go. We're good. Happy Wednesday. Sorry I missed you Monday. I went into Boston on Monday to see Jamie Cullum. Do you know Jamie Cullum? Like the jazz musician. He's a singer and he plays uh, piano. He's absolutely fantastic. Um, and you know what else I forgot? So we're running our show today and we are hopefully concluding our look at one of my favorite books in a long time um, in any genre. The Hooking Fairy Tales book by Robin Rennie. So we've been looking at this. This is the third time because we keep stopping and talking, which is what we do. And it's wonderful fun. Uh, and it's my favorite part of what we do. So um, so I don't rush us along at all. But um, let's look at this today. And then I will be running Friday night gallery night. I'm still deciding what to do for that. There's a very good chance I'm going to run the, the Rug Hooking Magazine's Celtic Book and Contest on that night. That's my plan in my head. I was going to run a show tomorrow, but I think I won't. And you know why? I forgot that on Sunday, it, it's our hook along. So for those of you who ordered um, the kit for Willow Weep for me, Willow Tree, with little pennies, like penny rug pennies, um, that's either with you or it's on the way. It'll certainly get there in time. And for the rest of you, if you are logging on on Sunday night, I'll probably be live for over three hours. So I will be hooking that Willow Tree pattern from beginning to end. We might even be looking at three to four. So we'll see how it goes. It's going to be an epic hook night. So I thought, I forgot about that. So let's do a show today. Let's do our Friday night cocktail night. And then I will be with you Sunday for a long spell for a, a beginning to end hook in. And if you are a beginner hooker and you missed ordering the pattern, you can always order the pattern later. It will be recorded to watch later. But also you could just pick up whatever you're starting with or working on. And it might be during the course of that time that I'm hooking that piece from beginning to end. It might be that I answer questions or you ask questions of, you know, beginner questions or, or I'm stuck questions. And we'll have plenty of time on Sunday night to deal with all of those questions and answers. So I'm looking forward to that. I just forgot about that. Good to see you, everybody. Let me come back here. Let me change my glasses. The other glasses were good for both. Let me put on my... Um, Speaking of fairy tales, like Little Red Riding Hood, Granny glasses here, right? Like these guys, uh, just to see who's here. Mom, good morning. Great to see you in sunny Granby. It is sunny again here. Well, it's a little bit sunny here in uh, Bethany, Connecticut. Lynn, great to see you. Sunny and warm in Tucson. Jude, great to see you from cloudy UK. But I bet it's still beautiful and super, super green, right? I never mind the clouds in, in England. I could always forgive the weather in England. The Netherlands was different. I think I lived there too long, but in England, I could forgive England anything, even the clouds, right? It's so beautiful. Chrissy, good morning. Great to see you. Linda, great to see you. You're playing with your yarn today. Super fun. Jane, great to see you, my love. Happy anniversary yesterday. Linda Ann, great to see you in cool, wet Edmonton, Alberta. Oh, we are all getting blasted with different kinds of spring weather. April, good to see you in Illinois in crystal gorgeous day, Nova Scotia. Karen, oh, good to see you again. Are you kidding? Cold and snowy, Black Forest, Colorado. Wow, it's such extremes, isn't it? Such extremes in Colorado. Linda in Massachusetts, great to see you. And Heidi in Belgium, Huda Ava, great to see you. Good afternoon, everybody. Cats Gallery in Southern California, great to see you. So a few things before we get started. I'm just trying to, catch my brain is trying to catch up with what I'm doing because as soon as I uh, finished up with Monday, I hit the ground running. I was working on a, I was working on another project. I'll see if I can grab it during the show. I'm working on a couple of projects that I keep forgetting to tell you about. I keep forgetting to say, for those of you who are interested in punch needle, I do have a beginner punch needle class out and I keep forgetting to promote it. It's called Starflower. So I literally just put it on my backing here. It's this kind of a pattern, very traditional pattern. And it has more, I colored it with a computer and I'm just gonna quickly punch probably a quarter of it to show you what the color plan is. It's a good size to turn into a pillow. Uh, and this project comes with a punch needle and it comes with a 12 by 12 frame. And the pattern on rug warp, which is perfect for punching, um, is gonna be attached to the frame with upholstery tacks. So you will be able to punch that as a beginner on a perfectly taut, tight as a drum, frame, ready to go. And then when you're done with it, you can unpin it and reuse the frame. 
because there is nothing wrong with, particularly with punch needle, where you don't have to have a hand underneath, right? You don't need that stepped tier. Um, it's perfectly fine to use a frame. I mean, that's essentially what you do. And using tacks is the same as using teeth. So this class, Starflower, comes with, these are some of the colors I was working on. I only had time to twist these guys, and I'm twisting, winding these in a little while. So this is an awkward way to show, but this is the color palette for Starflower. So some dark, dark light, dull bright, DLDB, right? Super fun. I'm going to put it down over here. Um, so make sure that you're signed up for that. I pushed it back one week because I was waiting for the punch needles, which are arriving today. So these will all ship, and I believe this class is two weeks from today. So if you would like to join in with the punch needle, it's a great way to jump in, to get the punch, to get a frame, to start punching right away with me. And um, I think it's a two-hour class. Um two Wednesdays from now. So that should be a lot of fun. I hope you're signed up for that. Brenda, great to see you. 89 degrees. Oh my gosh. That's, it's getting up there already. Dave, great to see you. Linda Ann, love that pattern. I love it too. It's, it, I love traditional patterns. I hardly ever do them. It might be that I do my game. I'm fooling around with glasses now. It's like, I've got three pairs in front of me and neither, none of them are good. Um, it might be that with this pattern, you know, I love working on this kind of frame that tilts when I do punch needle stuff. I won't do all of it because it's too close to the edges, but I like to tilt and see how my work is going, you know, because when you're punching, I'm working into, this isn't the punch needle that it comes with. Um, this is a way longer one, but, you know, you're working into it and your loops are coming up in the back and it's really tempting to want to constantly look and peek, right? Do peekies. So it might be with this pattern that I do it in the colors that that I've already dyed, right? I dyed those um, over the weekend. It might be that in the center or in some areas that I do something blingy and I do something with like um, a fancy fiber, just adding something in, something for fun. Doesn't this look so lethal? All of these stabby crafts, right? Um, felt needle, punch needle, stab, stab, stab. All right, so that's coming up. And um, yeah, let's jump in. I think I have some cues for myself built into today's episode and I will keep an eye on, not going to work. We're going to go for number three, right? Uh, lady or lion, Jude. Yes, rich green plus lots of plowing. Wonderful patchwork of colors. Oh, perfect for a rug design. It's always perfect for a rug design, isn't it? The, the English countryside with those uh, rolling cut up pieces, right? And they're often in different directions. And it makes its own pattern, particularly for me, the area around Bath, like coming into Bath and driving and seeing all of those hills just absolutely so beautiful. I remember somebody saying, it was probably a poet um, or reading somewhere, that if, if your idea of beautiful is green, then you would love Britain. And if it's not green, then you probably wouldn't. And for me, my idea of beautiful is green, right? I'm not a tropical person or a beach person. I love lots of colors of green. So that sounds like heaven and that sounds like a perfect rug pattern. Heidi, that is a regular punch. That's traditional punch. So this is not the miniature punch. That's also called Russian punch. This is the punch needle punch, right? And I stock the, this is a long one I was experimenting with. They sent me a whole bunch of different ones because I order mine from Maria, a girl in Brazil. And her company is called, what is it called? Mercado de Hacienda. And I've really loved their needles. Um, I only like the, I like the worsted weight more than I like the um, regulars, right? But this one's very, very long. So you know how I play that game with putting the washers on to get different heights of loop. I, I, I like this one and I keep this one around just in case I want to do really long loops. But normally, this is the one that comes with your kit. It's the same size shaft. So it's worsted weight as opposed to regular, a little bit finer. But you can see that the shaft um, difference is huge. And I would only use this one, honestly, if I was planning to clip the surface like a latch hook that I would be, this would be definitely the one to use. But normally this is the one to use for me, right? Because um, whether you are using the wrong side as the finish side, the working side, you want, you want a lower pile. I always want a lower pile because I like to see the loops and I don't like to waste a ton of materials because that gives me stomach cramps. So I like these smaller ones, but I've really loved, I really love her needles and I love that there's an eyelet on them to guide the thing and you can kind of twist the eyelet a little bit depending on how your hand holds the punch needle, but this is traditional punch and lots of fun. Um, hold on one second. Let me shout out. Is my elephant out there that I was working on? I just want to show you on um, Monday, I just worked for like an hour in the morning on um, an elephant that I was freehanding. I was thinking about 
um, Martha's Vineyard and all like the elephant motifs that are popular right now. And I was thinking about, I'm not supposed to, I don't know if I'm supposed to say the word Zentangle because it's copyrighted, but I was thinking about doing an elephant like pillow, a, a bit of like a Lily Pulitzer color palette. And I just drew this elephant on here. He's actually one line and his tusk comes up here. I think his, I think I did like this sweep and then I did the trunk and then he comes up here like this with the ear and then his tail does a little thingamabob so it really connects and then this ends this ends back at the tusk so I was kind of outlining it that way and I got quite far I mean I was only working on punches fast that's what I meant that's what I mean by this punches fast and it's done in like a it's sort of antique black I am going to take out the pink around here because I thought well let me fill it in with a little more pink but I think it's taking over too much and then you can see I just started freehanding some paisleys and stuff around the side. You see a lot of designs like this, and I always love them. The reason I started doing this um, impromptu project, I'll figure it out and I'll put it up as a kit. But I don't know, I was out with my mom last week when the kids were off school, and we saw like an elephant. She said, oh, you should do, you should do something with an elephant, right? Because people love elephants with their trunks up for good luck and all that. And I thought, you know, we should, I should do elephants. We've had a lot of people in our family who collect elephants and things like that, and it's a thing. And, um, and I thought, yeah, you know what, let me do that. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll do that thing where you add all kinds of like, uh, doodle as you go. Maybe, maybe I better say that doodle as I go kinds of Peasley's and uh, different floral designs and stuff. And, and I have this huge bin of yarns that I also dyed over the weekend and late last week that I plan to use for a lot of different projects. But when I looked at them together, I went, oh my gosh, this is like a total Cape Cod Martha's Vineyard kind of preppy palette. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to use that with the elephant. So I'm figuring that out. You like that, Jane? <laughs> I'll send you an elephant. Jane gives me so much help. I'll send you anything, my love. Deanna, would you have time to order a kit to get it to Canada before the class? Yeah, I can do that. Absolutely. I can do that today. No problem. Cindy, great to see you. Dawn, great to see you. I love the green too. I knew you would love the green. Oh, for regular punch, just catching up. That's so cute. Love the elephant. I also really like the backside. You know, I do too. That's always the thing with punch, isn't it? So I'll just say, this is why we don't uh, make a lot of progress on the show, but it's all important to talk about this stuff, right? So this is my working side and I'm punching on here and I'm drawing as I go with a red Sharpie, which isn't really uh, an indelible marker. It's not super permanent, but it's what I had in my hand and I'm lazy. So I just started to add patterns and I figured... I'll pattern the whole background out and I probably won't use black anywhere but here but I only got this far I mean I just I punched it and even the hour or so that I spent on it it wasn't two right it wasn't even two hours it goes so fast um, I even managed to screw up in a huge way because I had my punch needle it wasn't this one um, but you know I put the washers on it to get the height that I want I had two washers on it and I rethreaded it at one point. And when I did, I forgot to put the washers back on. And then I punched and punched and punched and punched. And I punched in like a huge part of the interior of the elephant. And then I flipped it over, right? This is why I like to flip as I go because I don't trust myself and I shouldn't trust myself because of stuff like this. And I saw that the loops were much higher. And I went, oh, Jesus, look at the washers are sitting right on the table. I forgot to put them on. So I had to pull that out. And despite that, I still got really far. But what I will do in the end, and this is the wrong side, and I'm not using this as the right side because I'm more of a this side person. And it's all mushy right here now, right, until I fill in all of the motifs. But I do like the good plush pile to it. Don't have, oh, Dawn, thanks. I'm, la I'm, I'm lazy in some little ways. I'm, I'm lazy in little ways. Um, there will come a time, and Ryan Richards knows this story. I don't think he's on. I think he's at work, where I will take my rug hooking hook um, and pull all of these little tails through to this side. And then I will take my bent scissors and clip them at the surface so that they are the same height as this. Because there's no reason at all to have them on this side. As long as they're on this side, to me, they're a danger because if I accidentally pull them or if I lean them up against something and it gets pulled out, there could be a very visible loop missing, right? With my luck, it would be like a crucial loop. Now that's a title for a memoir, a crucial loop, right? Or murder mystery. Uh, who's gonna write it I'm not I'm not you write it I like that um, but anyway lots of fun so those two things are coming out and yeah Starflower I can get out because I'm gonna get those uh, shipping this afternoon after the show I'm gonna wax some stuff together get it to the post office and I can wax some more together tonight I'm in the middle of the Madame LeBlanc uh, marathon that I'm having I've only got a trial of the platform that it plays on so I have got to finish watching it season two is excellent 
Um, Melissa, thank you so much for that suggestion. I am loving that show. So, all right, Indian or Thai style would be fab, Sharon. That's what I'm thinking, just more paisleys, more stuff. I, wait till you see the colors that I have for this. They really are so pretty, and they're not totally predictable, like Kelly Green pinks. It, it is that, but it's a lot of dolls, too, and I love my dolls. I love the multicolored, variegated dolls. They take you so far with one or two pops of the poison, right? Um, digging the elephant, please, <laughs> Heidi, why not pull them directly with scissors on the other side? Put them directly with scissors on the other side. Um, you do it that. Why not put them directly with scissors? Uh, do you mean you pull them through with the scissors or you poke them through with the scissors to get them to the other side? Um, or, or Heidi, do you mean you're leaving them on this side? Uh, sorry, on the working side. I'm curious. I pull them through with the hook just because this the rug warp is a super, this is the tightest backing that there is. Super tight, 100% rug warp. This is really my favorite backing for doing anything with yarn, whether it's hooking with or punching. This is my favorite punching backing by far. I like this much more than monk's cloth, personally. I just feel like it's got such um, integrity. And yeah, I mean, in, in you know, punch needles are sharp. It goes right, right through never rips i'm not overly careful right it's it always it always does well it's like magic to me and i'm a big believer in this is one of the ways i'm lazy um a big believer in if if it ain't broke don't fix it so for me i, I always use this and i teach with rug warp and um punching and it always always works great knock on wood so far this is actually wood and um yeah people always have success so sign up for that if you're interested please it's going to be a lot of fun and it's a real pretty pattern that you could turn into a wall piece or a table piece or um oh these are some of the colors right i was this is when i was doing the dyeing that's some of the colors so this class is coming up this is embedded if you're interested in signing up for this this is in the text of this video as is this class which is coming up designing like paul clay are you ready for color are you ready for light are you ready for abstract and whimsical design? He does such a fusion, such a mashup of so many different themes. Look at the image on the, in the middle on the bottom. It's very neutral, but it's obviously a house with lots of bump outs. Super interesting. And to the left of that, the gray and orange kind of deco palette, really ev sort of evocative conversation, onion domes, um, super, just super cool, super, super, super cool, interesting artist. This class is available right now, Design Like Paul Clay. And I'll remind you of this later, but this is a bonus class coming up this month. We've been doing so much with fairy tales. Part two, Design Like the Fairy Tale Storybook. And I am announcing for the first time the fairy tales that we will be looking at on this day. Um, so this will be coming up for two classes. And the link to this is in the body, the description of this video that you're watching. The fairy tales that we're doing are The Nightingale. I think that's a Japanese fairy tale. Really beautiful story about a mechanical bird that's given to the king, and maybe you know the rest, but let's not spoil it. The Three Bears, I feel we have to cover, partly because of the famous Garrett Blue Nose pattern, but also it's a great story. And remember that meme I told you the other day on Facebook? It said, I find it hard to believe that bears were making porridge and the only thing wrong was the temperature. <laughs> So I love the little image of the um, one of the original illustrations of the bears in the center with the plumes of smoke coming off of their off of their porridge. So the nightingale, the three bears, the magic kettle. Now that's a really unusual one. I don't want to spoil that, but that's another uh, Asian one. I think that one might be a Chinese uh, fairy tale. The colony of cats is a very odd story about a, a colony of cats that's actually keeping people. So it's a role reversal story. And then the musicians of Bremen, classic um, and very very translatable to rug hooking, right? Because we see a lot of Bremen musicians in rug hooking designs. If you can picture the animals stacked up on top of each other to peek into the window. So those are the five that we're gonna cover. Five is a lot. So even though the class is two hours, it'll probably be more like two and a half hours because I don't rush. And if you're signing up for this class, it is a design class. And the idea is to design using prompts, using exercises and games that we play in class. I never put you on the spot. I never ask you to show what you're working on. You can just be sitting there spacing out and watch the recording if that's how you're feeling. And um, yeah, the idea is to design something based on a lot of drawings that I give you too. So you can even use my drawings full blast for your compositions. And I'm very happy when you do that too. That's great. I feel useful when I'm able to give you something that you can build on. 
So that's coming up as well. Those three things are in the body of this. Kara, great to see you in Illinois. Oh, Heidi, did you send a photo? Okay, let me check this out. You sent a photo. Did you send it to my Facebook, Heidi? We're talking about the punch needle. Maybe you sent it to my, I'm going to find it. I'm going to find it. It's not there yet. God, Belgium's not that far. I'll look out for it, Heidi. I'm curious to see what you mean. And this is a great way to ask questions live too. If you have a question about something that you're doing or looking at, you might as well send it to me on my phone because I can always show it to you um, using this camera too. This camera is very good. Linda B says, do you have an idea of when your rug warp will be back in stock? It is in stock. Uh, I mean, it's in the studio. I didn't realize it was out of stock on the website. I will fix that as soon as we get offline. I have an entire bolt of it. I have an insane amount of it. It's a extra, extra large, long bolt. Okay. Excellent. I will look for that, Heidi. And in the meantime, let's return to our book because this really is so great. I don't know that we're going to, I don't know that we're going to finish it particularly now because I've been uh, running my mouth for 23 minutes. So let's see. I wanted to show you some more stuff here because as with, I'm just going to start here as a placeholder because this is the, that was the image that we ended on um, in the last show. I'm going to start as a placeholder with the um, conversation that this is the reminder this is a book that is comprised of fairy tale rugs from the golden age of illustration, which is basically um, broad, 1880 to 1920, I could say 1930, um, basically, right? That's what we think of as the golden age of illustration. And the Pearl McGowan Teaching Guild, right? The, the group of uh, teachers who are Pearl McGowan certified got together to make these rugs and they are stocked by the Honey Beehive also in Connecticut, the company, right? If you want to buy the exact ones that are in this book, most of these images are copyright free, right? So these are taken from famous illustrations. And this book is broken down by chapter into the, the artist. So for example, we finished on the last episode talking about Arthur Rackham. We looked at a few of the rugs, but we also looked at a lot of Arthur Rackham's own paintings, right? He was a wonderful pen and ink illustrator, add a little bit of color, a little bit of watercolor, right? Um, a little bit macabre, right? Very distinctive art style, very famous illustrator, certainly synonymous with the golden age of illustration. So this is how this book is broken up. But I also want to remind you, you know, next time you're in a bookstore, um, a used bookstore, some nice old yard sale where you've got a lot of old books there, it is remarkable how many fairy tale books um, are out there or children's books that are illustrated by artists who we have never heard of who are absolutely fantastic. And sometimes the artist is not even cited because the book is published by a publisher who hires a stable of artists and they are working for an hourly or weekly wage and they're very happy to do it, but it's not a situation where you would say, this is so-and-so's work, mm -hmm. right? It's not always like that. And in many cases, in most cases, particularly from the golden age, this is copyright free stuff because of its age. So in general, if you're looking at stuff before 1928 at this moment, um, you are looking at stuff that's copyright free. So you can have at it. And my point is you could well discover something really, got it, Heidi, really interesting um, that inspires you or an artist who really inspires you who illustrated fairy tales and we don't even talk about them. So, oh, I see. Oh, okay. I see what you're doing. Let me share this with you. Okay. Looks like, are you, this is what you're doing to get them to the other side. Heidi, you are a very tidy puncher. Looks like you're working on rug warp too. You're a very, very tidy puncher. So it looks like you are pushing it through with the scissors. Yeah, you could absolutely do that too. Absolutely, you could do that too. Yeah, that absolutely works. You've got some very good directional hooking going on. But yeah, that, I mean, I would never expect the um the rug warp is so um um substantial it's almost like mercerized cotton you know what i mean it's it's shiny it's glossy it's like seals itself it's 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 very durable um it's very it's very hard wearing so uh, um i could totally see poking through with scissors and not having to worry about cuts or anything like that and it's working for you so there's no issue with that that would easily work too um there's abs they're absolutely interchangeable and I know a lot of people deal with their tails, pulling them through as they work. And I normally do that, but I didn't have my hook with me the other day. I normally do that because I'm easily overwhelmed. And like when Ryan shows us photos of him having his stuff on the big tufting frame, and, and then he says, 
oh, okay, I'm, I'm all done with tufting. Now there's only, you know, 6,420 more tails to pull through. That makes me feel ill. You know, it's like, where's the, where's the smelling salts? Because that to me is overwhelming. That's, I usually do it as I go, but everybody works differently. Everybody has different tips, but that is Heidi's hack of the day that she's just doing it with the scissors as she goes. And that's really smart. I might just, I might just try doing that too. If my scissors um, are sharp enough, because this is part of the being lazy thing. Sometimes I've got the, the kitchen scissors with me, you know, or the kid's scissors that have the round head because I'm too lazy to like stand up and get the scissors that are right there on the table. I got to be me. We all got to be who we are, right? So this is the one we left off with last time. And um, yeah, Linda, I'll remember to put that back on stock on the website. I, I, I'm so sorry. I got to be better, uh, more sort of a, of a helicopter with the website stuff. So we're moving away from Arthur Rackham because the last one wasn't, was a Rackham and we are moving toward, well, this, this is obviously, um, Little Red Riding Hood and this is beautifully hooked by, uh, Libby Lundgren and this is 20 by 27, number three and number four cut wool on linen. But the illustrator here is Herbert Cole and he was a British illustrator. His life was, was between 1867 and 1930. So squarely, his adult life was in what we term the golden age of illustration. He was a prolific illustrator of children's books, and he was heavily influenced by Walter Crane the, and, and all the Paraphylite painters, right? Uh, and William Morris, right? So a real product of his generation, his time, and all of the prevailing art of that time. We have talked about Walter Crane on past sort of bingo nights. Um, really famous illustrator, really, really exciting. Um, he was married to, to Clara Gilbert Cole, who was a famous suffragette and anarchist uh, and very prominent characters in the anti-war movement. So they were very interested in social justice and socialist publications and uh, yeah, had kind of a bit of a parallel life. But, um, or, or uh, yeah, but not as such a secret life. They were very visible uh, with their hobbies at that time, which were uh, dangerous hobbies, but beautiful traditional handling of Little Red Riding Hood, uh, beautifully done by Libby. I mean, this is really great. It says underneath that one of the keys to the color plan was finding the right reds for Little Red Riding Hood's cape, since since this set the tone for the rug. Yeah, I think that is absolutely true, isn't it? And setting, I'm just adding this part myself. Setting it against that cool blue right? That kind of stony blue makes a lot of sense because those are absolute opposites on the color wheel. So she, obviously that would pop beautifully. It's almost like dropping a stage curtain behind her of a contrasting color and it's, and it's dull. So it's really helping her, her cloak to pop. Um, deviating from the illustration's original color plan, Lundgren chose to give Red Riding Hood a lighter dress and hose. Okay. So rather than I think she originally had, yeah, like a, like working clothes colors, right? She wouldn't have had white. That would be too pristine for a walk through the dirty woods and uh, hosiery too. But it does pop the child and it does give us a more traditional costume for a child, right? Something that we would expect. And then like the Mary Jane shoes. Um, hold on. Uh, blue grays rather than pure grays give shadows a richer tone while a mix of two different green swatches adds depth and contrast to the flower garden. So only two colors are green in the flower garden, but certainly one of them is mottled green because I'm seeing lots of different greens on those leaves. Really lovely. Uh, limited color palette, right? Mostly reds, greens, and blues, um, but so many colors, nonetheless so colorful. So really beautiful handling of this on Libby's part. I love the flowers, right? The flowers are just really Oh, Heidi says it was big work and uh, the direction has it um, has it a function in the work. Sorry, direction has it is function in the work worsted and uh, rug yarn. Yes. So uh, monk's cloth from Germany. Oh, my God. The monk's cloth from Germany looks a lot like the rug warp, warp from here. I wonder if there's a lost in translation thing there because it could be that you're calling that monk's cloth, but it's actually rug warp. Um, which wouldn't surprise me at all because why not? These All of these terms are moving targets, but that was beautiful fabric, Heidi. That was super beautiful st stuff, whatever it was. I'm going to put these side by side. Stuff is like the Dutch word for cloth. Right? I remember that one. So this is obviously a copyright image I'm using on the left. Shame on me, but it does show you. Oh, she's all in red. That is a bit of a, um, what's that Christmas character? You know, the bad, de the devil type character. You know the one. I think he's also, I think he's from Germany. 
Ah, oh, what's his name? You know who I mean. It reminds me of him. He's, he's very bad and he's all in red. I think all in red is a lot. The original illustration is lovely and it does have like a real uh, sort of countryside charm to it. Bit of a Homes and Gardens magazine to it. But it is oppressive, the all in red, right? She's got the whole Soviet palette going on in her costume. Just red, red, red and more red. Krampus, thank you, April. Um, oh, moving to Gambia. Hi from sunny Los Angeles. Great to see you. Oh, Kelly says no is from Kelly Wright and Amy Oxford instructor. So it really is monk's cloth. That's beautiful monk's cloth. Holy macro, because I know Amy Oxford gets her monk's cloth at um, door. This looks like Mark's cloth, uh, monk's cloth that is minus the grid, um, which is also available. I think door also has that. I always get the red grid for some reason. Good information, Heidi. Thank you. Uh, but it's nice to see the before and after of something like this as well. And you see also um, in the illustration that Libby put like a little blue cloth over the stuff in the basket, right? Which is also nice, very civilized. I do like the change of costume very much. That makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, kind of funny that the um, tassel hanging on the door for a ringer, you can just see a rope with a bell attached on the other side, right? Really, it's an old-time charm. And the ground is different, too. I like the way that Libby has grounded the character with this color-changing color brown um, because in the original illustration, there is more of a diagonal pull, right? So very, very, very different. I would say completely different. You could tell that it's taken from that one, but I really like the changes. I think they were very helpful changes that were made in the second one. I think the composition is just more interesting. Um, and here is another one that was dis that the original illustration was again Herbert Cole and obviously this is the three bears and isn't this absolutely charming I'm going to show you the original of this one too this one is hooked by before I forget the three bears uh, hooked by Cheryl Singley and this is 30 by 30 number three to number eight cut uh, um, on linen and it said this rug took on a special significance to Singley I hate using the last names. I'm going to say this rug took on a special significance to Cheryl, who portrayed each of the bears with the personality of her own grandchildren. Oh, my God. The oldest is eight and a leader, and the middle is two and loves to wear things on her hair. <laughs> Look at that little hat. While the one-year-old is good-natured and goes with the flow, sometimes thinking of real people can help a hooking artist give character to the subject of the rug absolutely and make it so much more personal and special i absolutely love this really love this do you notice the first bear there has the top hat on and i, I just love mama's uh, little fascinator whatever she's got on with her with her brawly and then the little the little tyke pulling the, the piggy isn't that cute let's look at the original design too this is absolutely beautiful some of the things i really love about this I love everything about it. Number one, I love the story, right? That this is based on like three children and that's super special. I love the way that the three bears is outlined really well. Like it's fading like parchment, right? With really distinct outlining, very crisp, very readable, really lovely. I love how the bears are in two colors. You get that dark black and then you've got that kind of gray or antique black. To me, that makes a lot of sense because it echoes an etching. Right. So to me, that makes sense. I don't I'm not a big fan of too many shades. It's just my taste, as you know, as some people are right. Viva la différence. Like, good thing we are all so different and, and special. Um, but I love very graphic handling of um, shades. And for me, this is very graphic. I love it. I love the, the, the kind of menacing claws, too. Right. It really shows you the position of the of the paws. I was going to say hands, but paws. Um, very well done. And on the bottom right hand corner, I love how the ground is the same color as the ground that we're seeing and the shadows are fantastic and the modeled coloring of the pathway is fantastic. But on that bottom right hand corner, right, for distinction and to frame up the bottom of it, we're seeing kind of minty green grass coming up through the existing color. And to me, that's really smart. Very naturalist, very smart. Let's look at the original um, picture for this. So quite similar, actually, quite similar. I wasn't expecting to see all those little tropes in there, but they're there. Really beautiful composition. Herbert Colt really is excellent. I almost prefer this one to Red Riding Hood because we're seeing the lines a lot better. Um, it's so sweet and so charming, and it seems very benign, except for those mean claws, right? Um, I, don't see, I don't see Goldilocks in this about to trespass, but we know she's there somewhere, and she's about to, like, empty out the house, right? But... 
interesting, really beautiful, some great illustrations. This is a very different Red Riding Hood and uh, different artists here. We have, we're moving away from Herbert Cole and we're looking at John Hassel. This piece is hooked by Pamela Mormon Schmelzel, S H sorry, S C H M E L Z L E. Beautiful piece, uh, number three to number six cut wool on linen. It doesn't have a size. John Hassel is another great British um, illustrator, 1868 to 1948, um, best known for posters of that time. Right, he's another person who's really synonymous with the golden age of illustration. A uh, little bit of biography in all of these chapters. It says, hoping initially for a military career, Hassel twice applies, applied to the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, but was rejected both times. So I, I'm only going to say that part because obviously he, he then becomes an artist. Uh, lucky us, right? But it's just interesting that you get these biographical touches in this book. It means a lot, right, to get some background on people because they aren't just people who uh, you, you regard as like a Rembrandt in some dark studio on the upper floor of this wobbly old building, cutting plates and, and making, you know, etchings. These are people who had lives and made decisions and, and their art is affected by all the twists and turns their personal lives took. And, um, and thank God for that too. I love this composition because do you see that subtle S of the pathway that brings us to her? And then we have almost a Wizard of Oz feel, like remember the poppy feel, uh, poppy field, almost that kind of a feel as she swoops down kind of uh, into the flowers, right? Probably picking flowers for grandma. The swirl of the cape is so poster art from that period, isn't it? It's so um, shape driven. And the fact that one of her little, um, um, it's not an epaulet, it's more like a frog, right? Like a frog on clothing uh, is undone is interesting to me. That's in the original illustration too. I think I have that to show you too. Um, it's interesting because seeing part of her costume not tidy, not done up, for me suggests um, a, a small unraveling, right? So it's a little bit uh, unsettling, right? Something's wrong. Oh, excuse me, ma'am, your your uh, button came undone. Excuse me, sir, the barn door is open, right? Like that kind of thing. And you get a little feel of unease, like, oh, she's not really paying attention, is she? As she's looking at these flowers, she's focused on that, and that there's a wolf behind her, right? He's, he's right there. So interesting. I love um, I love the lines, and that is that is down to John Hassel. I also love the way that Pamela has hooked this. Look at that color uh, change right behind her, right? Like these dip dip dyed wools that go from kind of an aubergine to different shades of green. It's really compelling. The sweep of the path is absolutely beautiful. The different colors of flowers. Uh, I think it's important and interesting to have some of those yellow flowers matching the pathway behind her. I think it's also important to have some of the leaves be very different colors. Cool greens, warm greens, right? Lots of color change because it creates a field and a foundation to the composition, meaning at the bottom, that really is strong and organic. And it's very easy for your eye to sweep up into that S shape and find that really menacing looking silhouette back there against that happy blue sky contrast, right? Because if it was like a stormy sky, you'd be like, of course there's a wolf there. It's a stormy day. It's going to be miserable and haunted and awful, but it's a really sunny day. And that adds for me to the unrest, all these little clues in the composition or, you know, that, that are, are hinting toward uh, her dropping the ball on what she's supposed to be doing, which is stay on the path. If you remember the story, she was supposed to stay on the path. So this is the original illustration and you see some of the changes that were made. And again, I feel like the changes were very, very good. It is a poppy field in John Hassel's uh, illustration. For me, and I think for us now in, in our culture with our um, embedded Wizard of Oz knowledge, right, in visual uh, soundtrack, it's, it, we know poppy fields go with Dorothy. So for me, it makes a lot more sense to change the flowers. Uh, and to avoid the confusion, I just want to look at the hair. Okay, I like the I like the costume much better in Pamela's as well, um, because in the one on top it looks more like a bonnet, um, and I in in this one it has the pink sky, and a very barren landscape, a bit scarier. Whereas this one a bit more welcoming, a bit more friendly, a bit more colorful, um, a bit more magical. 
I do like this one better. I'm torn on the in personal choice. I do like the pink sky behind the wolf still, but you know, I'm a sucker for dusty rose. I like both of them so much. Let me look at this. Okay, so darker here on this one too. I just like to see the changes that were made. Look at all the kind the colors of red in the cloak. Isn't that fantastic? And did you notice the basket on the on her in her right hand peeking out from under the cape? Really well done. Really well done. I really love this one. I love the changes. It has a stretch. The one that Pamela did has a bit of a stretch to it. I really love that too. Really interesting. Um, and this is John Hassel. So, you know, wh when I could, I included an image of the illustrator. Because, uh, again, it's all about backstories too, isn't it? I mean, it's important to have a feel. He's another super handsome Gilded Age illustrator. Um, they all kind of look like this. Oh, oh, fancy meeting you here. You just happened to pop in my studio with this enormous amount of Victorian photography equipment. And here I am painting a really good portrait, and I'm only halfway through. Isn't that lucky? Um, I just love these. I love these. And the, these epic um, um, easels, right? I mean, absolutely epic. These these are not painters who um, were kind of down at heel, right, or having any kind of poverty issue. Now, this is another one. This is a different artist yet. So let me, hold on, let me find this one. I feel like I might have skipped it. Um, let's see. No, I'm good. Why am I not immediately finding it? I'll find it. Hang on. There we go. Arthur Dixon, British, 1872 to 1959. Uh, he was already a working illustrator at the age of 18. Super successful career. Um, he, you know, he termed, okay, this is why I know his name. He termed uh, the phrase schoolgirl novels. Um, and he did classic reprints of like Dickens, Alexander Dumas, Victor Hugo, Washington Irving. So, um, and you know, are you aware of these schoolgirl? I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole because this is a big one for me. I, I have, I, I had a huge collection of schoolgirl books and the periodicals, the, the, I think it was called the schoolgirl's own, um, or the girl's own. I think it was, I think it was the schoolgirl's own. But anyway, they're mysteries um, set in a boarding school. They had black and yellow covers. I had about 100 of them when I lived in Europe, and I ended up selling them when I came back. I hadn't set up this business yet, and I was still just a mom, and I never had any money. So I sold a bunch of stuff that I had already blown through. But before I did, I also have a huge collection of uh, British schoolgirl no novels, this era of the boarding house, right, for, for girls. Um, they're a little bit, many of them are mysteries, but it's just that, culture of girls being away from home of a certain class and the sorts of some of them were more drama driven and relationship driven and others were just full blast mysteries like Nancy Drew's um, they're just such good books you know such a moment in time and they're so charming and in England you find them all over the place so I had collected them from many trips to England and living over there and I collected a ton and I still have a ton but I sold a ton because I didn't need like I didn't need hundreds, right? I still have 50. That's probably good. But this is a great genre to pull from. And he is the person who illustrated all of those magazines, which came out, I think they came out more than monthly. They might have even been weekly. They're so interesting. One of the reasons I decided to part with them was because the text is beyond small. Like small is the wrong word. Tiny is also the wrong word. It was like you needed a microscope. Like you needed like, uh, you know, a kind of microscope to look to look into a, a different uh, galaxy. It was like incredibly tiny. N nothing, not even my number four glasses could get me there with reading print like this. Um, but when you have young eyes and you would be buying these magazines, I guess your, your eyeballs still work. But anyway, he is the artist who is behind that whole era of illustration. Uh, very, very famous uh, books, particularly particularly in Europe, right? Particularly in England. So this one is so beautiful. This is hooked, I should have said this first, by Connie Bradley. And this piece is called, get this, get this, ready? The Frost Could Not Stop Admiring Her. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? I just really love this piece. It's so, this is a piece, right? I mean, it's, I love, it, it, it's so lyrical. The frost could not stop admiring her. It's so beautiful. At the same time, it's very specific. Like when I think about a piece like this, whether it's an illustration or a rug, unless I hook it myself, I'm thinking, would I, would I want that and would I hang that? Because it's so specific, right? That's the thing about illustration is they are picking out a plate from one, one line of text. I'm just going to move this over here so we can look at them both at the same time. Um, and, and it is like out of context, it's like what in the world what, what in the world is going on here? 
Um, but this is the this is sort of an allegory or, or the personification of Frost, and he is there admiring this beautiful girl. So hold on just a second. I'm just trying to shape this up as well as I can for you. This is a very true um, rendering of this piece. I mean, talk about wow. Talk about wow. Um, so um, Connie Bradley, holy mackerel. Uh, Connie chose to remain faithful to the color palette of the original illustration. Achieving these colors involved creative use of spot dyes to capture the older look of the colors, especially in the copper-colored patterned dress, which, was, which has a worn look. Creating the necklaces in a way that looked realistic and allowed the beads to stand out posed a challenge. The first attempt, sculpting, uh, resulted in a pom-pom look. The second attempt using beading was very effective. Okay, so she's holding, you see she's holding in her hands um, a necklace. And I guess that may be an important part. Let me see if I can stretch this one a little bit, Connie's. Hold on. Uh, this is just such an extraordinary piece. It's just absolutely, absolutely incredible. Hold on. I'm going to see if I can get those. And remember, I, I have photographs of the book. You know what I'm going to do? I'm being a ding dong. I'm just going to show it to you from the book and see how close I can get. So you see how there's beads there at the bottom? So it looks like the red beads are hooked, but the pearls in between are giving it like, whoa, focus, are giving it um, an incredible layer of, of interest. Oh, the elephant just fell on me. I was wondering what that pain, what that pain was, all those combs. So Arthur Dixon, another great British um, illustrator, as I was hinting at at the beginning, there are so many illustrators, right? So if you're loving these and go, oh, I want to do some of these, yes, you should, and they're available at Honey Beehive. Um, but also, if you have some old books, look through them because you might go, oh, but I'd rather do this one because it's infinite. It's absolutely infinite. And I have to say, some of my favorite fairy tale illustrators are all, of all time are not in this book. And I love this book, and it's infinite. But some of my all time favorites are not in this book. And it just goes to show, and that's why I have these fairy tale classes too. That's why specifically I, I chose the fairy tales I did for the second one because I want to look at some artists who aren't in this book that I hope that you're going to go, holy mackerel, right? So much to see, so much to find. Let's go a little bit further with today. We're never going to make it to the end of this again. I don't want to keep hitting the same subject either. I had so many more slides to show you. You can see this is very dense because part of it is looking at the hook drug, but part of it is conversation too, isn't it? And this is a great opportunity with this particular book. Um, the, the original illustrations are not in the book, but you know, you're obviously on the computer. So it's a great opportunity to then pull up the illustration and go, oh, if you like this kind of conversation about what changes and what choices did the, I'm going to sweep this one over, did the original, um, did the hooker make this is a great book for that, right? Because it's very easy to find these illustrations. So hang on, I'm fooling around again. Let me bring you back here. All right, hopefully you can see both. So this is, uh, this is hooked by Pat Sahakian, and this is called Who's That Nibbling? An illustration by one of my favorite illustrators of all time, Ann Anderson. Never hear that name, do you? But holy mackerel. Very and much softer look, isn't it? Very watercolor driven. Um, this piece is 16 by 22, number three to number six uh, cut. Really, really lovely. And Ann Anderson was Scottish. So they're not really sure about the, the her lifeline. I mean, isn't that odd? She was born in 1874, and it's not clear whether she died in 1930, 1936, or 1952. Probably because her name is Ann Anderson. And there's probably a lot of Ann Andersons who were Scottish, who did art, right? She was never super famous, uh, but she did, she did illustrate a lot of books and she illustrated from the uh, Grimm's fairy tales and Anderson's fairy tales. So, I mean, she did a lot of work, but through the years, right? She also decorated Royal Dalton China, which a lot of women did at that time. Just sort of sitting in a studio, that was your paid job, like painting the China. If you watch any of those British antiquing shows like Roadshow, Road Trip, um, any of those, um, bargain hunt, right? You do see uh, p examples of China that women have hand painted and that conversation comes up a lot. But she's not a well-known person anymore. In her lifetime, it seems like she had a lot of work and she did really well for herself. 
Uh, and it is odd that they can't really nail down her biography any better than that. Um, but what a beautiful piece. What a beautiful painting and what a beautiful piece that Pat has hooked. Um, so let's just look at these side by side and, and talk about the differences. So I'm going to drag this one over just a little so we have a little bit more definition. Um, Pat definitely made the image scarier, right? So the one on the right is cropped, right? Because we're not seeing, this is the best one I could find. We're not seeing uh, Gretel. And you see she's there. But the children are done beautifully. Um, I'm just looking at the heart on Gretel's apron and I'm trying to remember, is that part of the story? I don't remember that. It's such a nice touch. Uh, but it is scarier, right? It's done more in blues. It seems like it's dusk or it's getting on. And it's uh, not surprising that the kids were wanting to nibble on the roof. It looks like the roof, it's, the roof for me is a little clearer in the illustration. It might be cookies or wafers or something. And yet they're nibbling away at the house. It's, this illustration isn't one, and we, we did Hansel and Gretel in the first design like the fairy tale storybook. So if you missed that first installment, it is available online and you get all the same materials as if you were doing it with me live. It's recorded, right? But it's still available. We talked about through the years, through the centuries, the different handling of Hansel and Gretel's house, right? Because at this point, you see contemporary illustrators making the house out of like Necco wafers and, and candies that we would associate with like, you know, modern times that are still for sale on the shelf. So interesting, but through time, it has gone through many evolutions, the house itself of being uh, in part bread or cookies, uh, licorice, and different things in different regions as well. So I just love, um, it, it could be because it's cropped on the one on the right that it is much darker, but it just feels like there is this sort of glow of moonlight in the one that Pat did on the left, the hook version, and I really love it. Another important change that Pat made is that she hooked the, the witch in green. And I really, I like that too. I think it really, she stands out as a witch. Let me see what the book said on this. I blazed right by that. Um, Pat combined a mixture of purple, brown, lavender, and orange to create the spooky woods in the background. This was not a combination of colors that was ever tried before, but these were uh, what Anderson had used in her illuminate in her illustration. And Pat chose to recreate the colors of the of the illustration. I guess she did. To me, there's a lot of differences here too. I mean, she moved the green from the doorway, right, from the architecture of the house, from paint the paint on the house. Um, to the witch's um, skin tone. To, to me, there's a lot of changes. I, and I really like I really like the changes. I like the straight uh, sort of striping of the witch's skirt because it really parallels um, her walking sticks, the double walking sticks, but also reminds me of like prison. So it almost looks like bars behind her, whereas the plaid just looks like homespun material. Interesting. Um, all of this, there's way more. Oh, wait a minute. Let me read a little bit more. I was going to say there's way more. She was delighted with how the combination translated into a hooked rug. The wicker basket cage presented a problem, and it took too much effort and skill to successfully hook in a manner that was um, convincing in appearance. So I don't see that in the original sketch, but there must have been some kind of cage in it in the original illustration. Um, but anyway, there's more to all of these blurbs. I'm just trying to speed up because we're going to run out of time again. And we're going to end on this one. So I'm going to put, I'm going to foxtail that. We can't come back one more time. Why not? Right. Um, cause like I said, part of the conversation is about the book, but I think most of the conversation for our intents and purposes, um, is more about what decisions do you make when you are hooking off of, off of anything, right? A photograph, an illustration, a book cover, uh, whatever. So I think these are important things to um, talk about together. And, and there are quite a few changes. And we talked about this a little bit in one of the earlier episodes, um, the idea of the witch, right? In a story like Hansel and Gretel, some illustrators show the witch as a witch who is playing with sort of the tools of her trade, all kinds of dice, very, very sketchy, right? Sketchy stuff. And when you see the interior of her house, um, you get kind of, you, there's a few illustrations that I'm thinking of that were in the first design like um, class where you're seeing her at the door, like kind of with her back to you, but you're seeing the, her room. So her room is a big character and here's her table with all her sketchy witch stuff on it. 
and she's moving toward the door to let the children in. And, you know, it's, it's, it's creepy, but it makes her a witch because in Ann Anderson's illustration, it's like, she's an old woman, like she's an old woman who's living alone. And this goes back to this historic conversation that I love to have about the Salem witch trials and about every dog town in Massachusetts, right? Every time there, at, at a certain point in history, right? Until we get further into the 20th century, and I would say it holds the same in the early 20th century, a woman living alone is a suspicious thing, right? This is what Greek tragedies are made out of. A woman living alone is uncomfortable, right? Historically, thank God that has changed, I hope, right, everywhere. Um, but it, it is a sketchy thing. And there is something unfair about the crossover between a woman who lives alone, particularly an old one, who we then start calling a crone, right, for no good reason. Um, is, she, is she a witch just because she lives on her own and she makes stew? Is she a witch because she dyes her clothes from plants that are outside and she knows how to do it, right? Is it witchcraft or is it figuring out which, which color is purple? Right? This is like this is a historic conversation that we can't have today, but uh, it's interesting to look at these old illustrations because it keeps bringing us back to these eternal talking points where we look at something and we say, "That's not a witch. That's a that's a lame old woman who needs two um, um, crutches to to move." But at that time, you know, she's alone and she's in the woods and she's got this wacky house. It turns out she is, if she's not a witch, she's at least a cannibal, right? So she's not a nice lady. But it brings us to all kinds of conversations. And then, of course, when you approach that fairy tale to translate it in your own manner and put on layers of interest that for you are personal or meaningful or the most important points, um, then you make decisions because you find yourself at all of these crossroads, particularly for fairy tales because they're familiar stories to us. You find yourself at all kinds of crossroads where you're thinking, should I go this way or should I go that way? Right. So Pat went toward, I'm going to do the witch with a green skin tone because right now in our culture, right in the 21st century, when you think of a witch, you are thinking of the Wizard of Oz and you are thinking of a different skin tone. You are not thinking of just a poverty stricken old lady who, for whatever circumstances, ended up alone and has to make it work. Right. Is living, you know, it's isolated life of a hermit. It's OK. I'm not going to start. But it is okay in all stories when there is a man who is a hermit living alone, right? He's just like a grouchy old man and he's a hermit. But when it's a woman living alone, she's a witch. Like, isn't that, oh, that's really something. All right, I'm going to stop. Super fun, mom. Thumbs up. Thank you. Like, subscribe, do the thumbs up. Because once in a while I do come to you spontaneously. Not often. But now that I'm getting the second book, Cat by the Tail style, right? And uh, getting things done, I, I'm... My plan is always to come to you more often, and I will sometimes do it um, spontaneously using YouTube as a platform because I know not everybody's on Facebook. So that was a lot of fun. I want to return to it because it's actually at the end of the book that my personal favorite hook drugs are. So I've loved all the ones we've looked at so far, but my very favorite, like five, are at the very end of the book, and we haven't hit that yet. So I'm kind of kind of ruminate in my mind. I won't come to you tomorrow just because I'm with you for the better part of the day on Sunday for the live hook in from beginning to end. So be sure that you're tuned in to that. Be sure you're signed up for the next design like fairy tale part two. Be sure you're signed up for Paul Clay, right? That's more of a fine art conversation. Lots of exercises and games that are going to get you some original Paul Clay style compositions. He's not copyright free. Paul Clay style compositions that you are going to love hooking and are super contemporary looking as well as contemporary as you would like them to be. Lots of fishes and stuff, which are great for coming into summer. So I will see you soon. Make sure you're signed up for the Starflower class, and I will send that to you either tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, the Design Like, the Paul Clay, and all kinds of other products out there. So I will see you on Friday for cocktail night. Either be expecting to go back to this book or to look at the Celtic book. I'll make a decision based on how much time I have to do some more culling uh, of slides and everything between now and then. Have a great tomorrow. And I will see you at cocktail time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.